Okay, you finished every show in your streaming queue. Time to join the Compact 20 virtual gathering. We're starting up momentarily. Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual Compact 20 gathering. I am Andrew Seligson, president of Campus Compact, and it is an enormous pleasure to welcome you. I say good afternoon, that's true if you're in the continental United States, and we know that there are folks joining us from other places in the country and the world. We welcome all of you, whether it's morning or evening or night, and we appreciate your being with us. What I'd like to do for this opening session is to begin with some kind of housekeeping items related to this virtual conference, and uh, then talk a little bit about the theme for this whole gathering, and then move into our first substantive session. So to begin, some housekeeping items. One is that we ask you to note that by participating in this event, you are agreeing to abide by our code of conduct. Our staff will be sharing the link to that code of conduct in the various chats now on the social media platforms where you may be watching this. Uh, the code of conduct is essentially about keeping this space respectful and constructive. We appreciate your taking a moment to familiarize yourself with the policy, but if you simply behave civilly and respectfully, we shouldn't have any problems. Uh, so we, again, thank you for taking a look at that and also participating actively in that way. Secondly, we'll be recording each session today and those recordings will be available in the coming weeks so you can point others to those. If you have a question for any of the presenters throughout the conference, that goes for our first session where I'll be talking with Raj Vinakota or uh, any other session, you can simply put it in the chat in the stream you're watching on Facebook or YouTube Live, wherever you're watching it. We have staff volunteers who will be compiling the questions for Q&A happening at the end of the session, and then we'll get to as many of those as we can. If you have a technical question, you can also post it in the Facebook or YouTube Live chat, and one of our members, uh, staff members will be uh, happy to assist. So that's a little bit just about how this will be operating uh, and we'll be streaming it free and live on those platforms, Facebook and YouTube Live throughout the conference. Next thing I wanna do is recognize our sponsors who have made this event possible. 
As many of you know, we intended this to be an in-person event in Seattle, Washington, that now would have been six weeks in our rearview mirror. And as circumstances changed, our plans did as well. And we're incredibly grateful to our sponsors for sticking with us through that transition and for continuing to support us in a, uh, an unknown format with very different opportunities for engagement and connection. And so we, we, we always appreciate our sponsors, but they deserve uh, a really extra special uh, shout out in this case. Uh, so I wanna thank the All In Campus Democracy Challenge who are among other things partners with us in the work of engaging students in voting participation. Compact to Learn, the platform that we have developed in partnership with Liaison International. KPMG, uh, a longtime sponsor of Campus Compact and supporter through all forms of philanthropy uh, to whom we are always grateful. Up to Us, uh, an organization that's focused on engaging young people in shaping the dialogue about issues that will affect their future. And uh, again, partners with us substantively in the work of supporting dialogue uh, and deliberative dialogue for uh, faculty and students and staff. We thank the College for Social Innovation. They're uh, our neighbors when we work out of an office space in Boston, uh, doing terrific work, uh, helping students develop the capacities to be change makers through a really innovative form of education. The School for International Training, again, a, a great contributor to teaching students uh, how to be active and engage contributors to the public good, both in the United States and around the world and Stylus Publishing, who is Campus Compact's partner in publishing books uh, that help advance our work, and they publish many other higher education-related materials as well. We want to recognize our design sponsor, GD Loft, uh, who created the beautiful branding for Compact 20. Uh, they are led by a faculty member at Rutgers Camden Allen Espiritu, an engaged faculty member who for years has been engaging his own students in publicly oriented design work. And so we, we really appreciate their support. You would have seen so much more of their work if we'd been able to gather in person in Seattle, but you see them in, in some of the design uh, in the, the branding for the conference. And we also want to recognize our friend Lauren Kramer at Turnkey Events, our production sponsor for this event. Lauren had been working with us really for the last two years to prepare for the event in Seattle. She's an extraordinary event planner and she has continued to work with us, uh, dedicating a significant amount of her time to helping us make the transition to a virtual conference. Uh, and so if you need a person who knows how to make events work in person, online, et cetera, turnkey events, Lauren Kramer, uh, we can vouch for them. Um, one last note before we dive in is that uh, I, I simply want to note that, you know, frequently at conferences, a highlight is connecting with other people, meeting people uh, who you've never met before, reconnecting with longtime colleagues. And we can't make that happen in precisely the same way in a virtual format as we might have in person. Uh, what we have done is created a Slack workspace for virtual networking around themes and issues um, you'd have the op opportunity to engage with presenters, some of the organizations I just mentioned who are doing important work in our area. Uh, and it's like everything else about this event, it's free, and we hope you will uh, participate. So the way you can find it is if you go to events.compact.org slash conference slash networking, that is, uh, again, you can find that from the, the conference website, but that's where you can learn more about the Slack uh, workspace, how to participate in the net networking, uh, get yourself signed up and, and be ready to go. I also want to mention, you know, this spring has obviously been extremely difficult for everybody, for the country, for the world, for higher education institutions, for so many of us personally and our families and friends. Uh, it has also been a challenge for Campus Compact and the long-term economic and financial impact of the crisis that we're in has yet to be fully felt. We decided when we went to an online format to maximize participation. We realized that the one thing we don't love about in-person conferences is that so many people who would want to be there can't. And so we decided if we were moving online to make it free, to stream it on open platforms, and to try to give as many people as possible the opportunity to participate. 
That also means it does not bring us uh, financial support that helps offset the enormous costs of bringing an event like this forward. If you want to help us out, uh, you can go to compact.org slash give. So if you like what you see, that might be a reason uh, you would go do that. You know, if you don't like what you see and you think we'd be doing better if only we had more resources, compact.org slash give. If you're indifferent to what you see uh, and just simply think it might make you feel like a better human being to give, you can do that. Uh, we always say that any amount uh, is, is terrific and we mean that. So $50, $10, $5, whatever you can give. It is also true that if you happen to be able to add extra zeros to those numbers, that's also great. So don't hesitate to do that if that happens to be within your means. Uh, and again, we appreciate any and all support. I just want to, uh, before we jump into our first session, say a few things about the theme of our conference and the ideas that we hope to be exploring over the next few days. The, the theme of the conference that we settled on quite a long time ago is the promise of full participation, democracy, opportunity, voice. And that theme really is grounded in a, a very short series of logical steps. We start with the premise that, that is behind all of our work, which is that the equal dignity of all human beings means that all of us should participate fully in the political, the economic, the social, and the cultural lives of our communities, of our countries, and of the globe. And we know that if we are to get to that vision of participatory public life, higher education has to contribute. Can't do it alone. We would need lots of social institutions, political institutions, economic institutions involved, but higher education is essential if we are going to make the kind of change that would make that vision real. And our reason for being a campus compact is to ensure that higher education has the motivation, the tools, the support it needs to make that contribution. We see ourselves as a key element of the movement for the public purposes of higher education on the road to full participation communities and a full participation country. And we all know that we are a very long way from realizing that vision of full, particip full participation. Polarization and inequality, the great forces pulling us apart over the last several decades in this country, they make getting there a generational challenge. We also know that the current crisis, the pandemic we are in, COVID-19, it both casts into sharp relief these existing divides, and it also exacerbates them as both the health and the economic consequences of our current crisis are coming disproportionately to bring suffering to communities historically excluded from voice and opportunity, particularly low income communities and communities of color. And we know that the current crisis is at its heart a public crisis. It is a public health crisis, but it is also a crisis of public leadership in which our most powerful elected officials have come to assume that they are not really accountable to the vast majority of us and our well being. And all of this means that the challenge before us is both more urgent and more difficult than ever. It makes it easy to want to retreat into comfortable spaces of agreement. I think all of us feel like we've experienced plenty of pain this spring. And so going forth and engaging across difficult divides seems especially daunting and maybe unwanted. But I also think we know that that way lies catastrophe, that without somehow getting to a lasting consensus on the need to renew our democracy, we will remain in the sort of bouncing back and forth between the parties stalemate that leaves our major challenges unaddressed. We were not ready collectively in the United States for the current disaster. And if we don't change the nature of our communities and of our country, we won't be ready for the next one or the one after that. And we know in an inter interconnected world, a world already facing a, an enormous climate challenge, we know that there will be more disasters, more challenges, more crises. And the question is whether we will be able to face them or whether they will take us further and further apart from each other and undermine 
the economic progress, the political democracy that we all cherish. So our conversations over the next several days are aimed in ways large and small at building our capacity toward full participation communities. It is the long game. There are other games that can and should be played on much shorter time frames. They require all of us as active participants in our democracy and our communities to be engaged, to be involved, to be paying attention, to be communicating with our neighbors, reading news, registering, voting, getting other people out to the polls in favor of whatever view we believe makes the most sense right now. Those games have to be played. But the long game also has to be played, and that is the one that Campus Compact is focused on. The rebuilding connections, the rebuilding communities, the re-strengthening of our social institutions, especially higher education, to meet the challenges ahead of us through partnerships, through education for engagement, through the reconceptualization of our colleges and universities as agents of positive change. We will learn through the next couple of days that there are many people and many institutions that are already doing staggeringly wonderful work in this direction. We need it to be comprehensive. We need it to be pervasive. We need it to be what American higher education looks like start to finish. So that is the work ahead of us. I am thrilled that you are with us to engage in this conversation. We have uh, a whole range of sessions, again, to dig deep into these questions. This afternoon, we will begin with one of those conversations and then move on to our annual awards event, which we're excited to share with you. But right now, uh, I am excited to move into our, our first session of the conference. And to do that, I am joined by Raj Vinakota, who I think through the magic of technology will in moments be upon your screen and maybe even right now. Welcome, Raj. Welcome. Thank you for having me here, Andrew. Uh, well, we really appreciate your being here. Uh, and I will now share a little bit about who you are. So Raj Vinakota is the president of the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. He's been in that role for a bit less than a year. Prior to joining the foundation, Raj served as executive vice president of the Youth and Engagement Division at the Aspen Institute, a new venture focusing on youth leadership development, civic engagement, and opportunity. And before his time at the Aspen Institute, Raj was the co-founder and CEO of the SEED Foundation, the nation's first network of public college preparatory boarding schools for underserved children, and he remains on the board of that organization. Raj is a graduate and has served as a trustee of Princeton University. Uh, I won't read for you all of the many uh, recognitions that Raj has received, um, but his extraordinary contributions in education, in uh, youth development, civic leadership have been recognized widely. Uh, and we are very, very pleased uh, that Raj is here with us today. And the, the occasion for that uh, is in significant part a body of work that Raj has led, which, which he will tell us more about uh, over the last year and change, focused on understanding more about civic education and, and redefining perhaps uh, that field. And so maybe uh, Raj, to get us started, uh, it would be great if you would just share with us how you came to be involved in civic education in particular. Sure, and Andrew, let me just begin with saying just how much of an honor it is to uh, be here. Um, I have to be honest, I wish I was in Seattle six weeks earlier, uh, but it's great to be here as the son of a college professor, as the husband of a college professor, uh, just uh, understanding just how important uh, higher education is in so many ways to the direction of our nation. And you spoke so eloquently about it just a few minutes ago. So thank you for that, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as for me, um, really my um, journey focused around civic education and, and civic learning uh, began uh, in the summer of 2018 when uh, after I left the Aspen Institute, I started to think about what I wanted to do next and really recognized what I think many of us saw then, if not much earlier, which is the house was on fire um, and trying to figure out what role could I play uh, to make sure that I could help to bolster our democracy. And over the course of the fall and into the winter, I was able to start working with a group of individuals 
uh, all of whom were leading or engaged uh, uh, in program levels at different foundations, who were scratching their heads because they had spent millions, if not tens of millions of dollars in the civic education space. And clearly they weren't seeing the output that they were hoping to see. And so in January of 2019, last year, I undertook a year long uh, study uh, to look into civic education, to try to better understand what it entailed, what were the major tension and issues, what were the definitions and even taxonomy of the space itself, and to do a landscape analysis and come up with some recommendations. And probably one of the most interesting things about that research was that it was funded by three foundations, uh, led by the Hewlett Foundation and also supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Koch Foundation. So it's a really interesting ideological uh, background and spectrum of people, all of whom were trying to figure out how could we have better outcomes in that space. So that's how I started the work. Um, the two key messages coming out of it, and of course there's an 88 page uh, report plus hundreds of appendices for those of you who want uh, to have access to it. But the two key things that came out of it were that number one, that looking at civic education usually leads to a narrowing or almost myopic view around that civic or government class that most, if not uh, many of us took as high school juniors or seniors. When in fact, if we really wanna think about this as developing effective and engaged citizens, we should take a much, much broader view that takes into account, well, well beyond high school and K-12, higher education, out of school experiences, what happens at the family dining room table, what happens in your homes, your communities, your religious institutions, at work and also online, because they all have an impact in how you think about not only your knowledge of your, your civic sense, but also the skills that you develop, your dispositions, your sense of agency, and whether you believe you can actually make a difference. And all of those pieces play a role. And so as a result of that much broader sense of what we're trying to do, there was a recognition that we did not have a field that could actually drive this work forward. So that was number one. Number two and related to that was that this space is severely undercapitalized. There is not much sustained, not very little cross-partisan investment that really recognizes that this work, as you mentioned earlier, is part of the long game. Uh, it has short-term implications, it has short-term impact, but it's also part of the long game that requires significant philanthropic support, and it wasn't there. So, Rash, let me ask a little bit more about that <coughs> first point, uh, the idea that there, there isn't the kind of field that we would need to, to ultimately support the kind of breadth and depth of activity uh, that you envision on the, on the road to change. And, you know, I can imagine just given who our, um, our sort of community is that gathers around Campus Compact, that people might feel like, hey, we are that field. You know, we write in journals, we attend conferences, um, there's some graduate programs focused on civic and community engagement. So when you talk about the need to build a field, uh, what, what's the kind of scope and scale of what you're thinking about? That's a great question. So there's a lot of research that's been done around just field building and what it takes and all of the different components of it. And I'm going to use one aspect of it as an example of why there isn't yet a field. And that is the shared identity. As I laid out, when one thinks about developing uh, effective and engaged community members and citizens, um, you have a number of inputs. You have to make sure that you develop their civic knowledge, their skills, their dispositions. And they overlap significantly with, for example, the social and emotional uh, learning work that's been happening in many different places um, with workplace skills development and so on. And if you look at the core aspects of what you're trying to develop, I'll take, for example, being able to work across difference to come to common solutions, being able to advocate for yourself, having a sense of agency in terms of being able to impact uh, decisions outside of your own decisions. All of those things, for example, are very much in the SEL world and also are connected to a sense of purpose and civic identity. If you go and talk to people in the social emotional uh, learning world and you say, are you part of civic education or civic learning? They would tell you, no, I don't, no, I'm, we're not actually in that space. And yet when you go a level or two deeper and you start talking about what this actually entails, they'll say, oh yes, that is the kind of work that we do. 
And that does overlap significantly. And so when you start to dig a little deeper, you start to recognize that that shared identity might exist in, in, in smaller groupings, like all the people who work uh, in Campus Compact. It doesn't go all the way out to a field. One other dimension I would just throw in, which is the one I said earlier, you could look and say, well, you know, there's many, many high schools that work on civic education through American history and governments and civics class. And yes, they also have an impact on it. But that's only one portion of this larger conception of civic learning. And there's no place that we learn it more than the fact that online has a larger impact than probably all of these things combined now. And so even though you have ways in which you're developing subfields, until you take all of these things into account and have a shared identity, standards of practice, research base, or, uh, and you have a, a, a field and teachers and so on and so forth, you really don't have a field. So uh, Raj, we've just hit a milestone here, which is we have our first question that came in uh, magically from our audience. Part of the story here is Raj and I can't actually see the people that are out there. So this is exciting. <laughs> Um, but I think it's perfect in this context. Um, so the question is, how do we build a common narrative that would that would be essential for that that field building? Great question again. Um, and let me give a little background about my research because this will help to provide at least a starting point. Uh, over the course of 2019, I had a, I conducted 200 about 125 direct interviews, uh, read lots of research, spoke to leaders in the field philanthropists, educators, uh, public intellectuals, and so on. And what I was able to do as part of that work is to get to a common understanding of what it meant to be involved in this space. That what we were trying to do is to develop young people who had three main aspects to them. One is that they were well-informed in terms of government and history and America. Second, that they were productively engaged for the common good. And third, that they were hopeful about democracy in America. Now, there's a lot involved there in those three simple statements. But what was clear uh, through a course of conversations and then a convening of 40 significant foundations that span the ideological spectrum, is that they could come to a general consensus around this definition. And so I would suggest that we use that as a starting point. There's many ways to go and you want to make sure that you have the kinds of debates and discussions about what each of those pieces mean, but that's a starting point. So in that, uh, in that context, how did you, I mean, essentially you talked about the ideological diversity of the foundations that have made this project possible. And, uh, and I know from having participated in certain aspects of this process of just the people that you're bringing together, how, how do you get to that consensus about that kind of account of mm -hmm. what the goals are of civic learning? Um, and kind of what what do you feel like um, is, is maybe not, that you had to not focus on in order to bring people together? What are the choices that are involved in getting to that consensus? So this goes back a bit to the narrative question. And so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kind of address that in a, in a second way as well, which is to say that um, probably one of the most um, surprising, maybe even relieving aspects of my work was just how much agreement there was and belief and desire to want to have our nation succeed. That people agreed that this space was fraught with tension, but it was tension that wasn't at the cost of breaking our nation apart. So what do I mean by that? I'll give you one very specific example that then starts to speak, Andrew, to your question. Um, there is in this space, of course, a tension that exists around those people who view our nation in kind of a city on a hill, exceptional nation, tradition, perspective, patriotism, right? I'm not saying nationalism, but patriotic perspective. And then those who view this from a social justice lens of things not yet achieved and therefore question where we are in our path to actually being able to get there. And that tension exists. But there was nobody with whom I engaged, nobody with whom we had this very intensive conversations, who said that one existed to the lack of the other, or one existed and the other did not. 
but rather a question of how to prioritize these two very important pieces of the work that needed to be done. And so I will say frankly that there were times where the agreement was this tension exists, that we're not trying to exclude either the tension or the disagreement or the other idea, but let's call it out for what it is and agree that we need to keep having conversations to try to figure out how you balance these. And then the second piece here was to also acknowledge the fact that some of these tensions would actually get maybe not resolved, but we would get much more data in testing and trying actually out in the real world. And so if we can come to some consideration of what the aims of our work should be, well-informed, productively engaged for the common good, hopeful about democracy in America, and we can start to set up some sense of indicators around that, and there are many that exist, we can then start testing different concepts in different locations with different dosage and see what seems to work and what doesn't. And then you're having a conversation about different approaches and what it is that you're learning. Now, you can't ever pull completely pull out the passion here, right? This is not like my molecular biology research where I'm going into a lab. There are always going to be biases and frames that you bring to the conversation. But at least then, you're trying to test different things and learn and engaging in a forward-looking conversation. And that's a lot of my perspective on all of the work that I'm doing in this space. I just want to mention uh, we are getting a number of questions, and I think we're going to be able to get to them all. So we're not ignoring them, but I will we'll weave them in uh, as we go forward. So I um, I love this the formulation, um, and it occurred to me that uh, so my training is as a political theorist, and we have the concept of essentially contested concepts. So concepts that mm -hmm. there's not we're not going to get to a definition of them in debating what they mean we are carrying out our th that is democracy democracy is one of those terms all the big terms justice uh, whatever right. else they are essentially contested to the core there's not some single definition and i feel like the the three things you've identified are also essentially contested that part of what doing the work is 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 engaging in the discussions about well what does it mean to be productively engaged for the common good etc but I also think that when I think about our community who comes together around Campus Compact, all three of those, and especially that productively engaged for the common good, I think uh, resonate with the work of the experiential, civic, and community-engaged learning that is at the heart of, of what so much, many of us do. So if we, if we take seriously those kind of three goals, et cetera, uh, what is, what's the process? What's the, the theory of change? What's, what's the work ahead? To, to get to a place where we see young people and, and increasingly older people who, who uh, exhibit those three dimensions? Let me give you this answer both on a very practical level, because I think many of the people engage directly with students, uh, the community, both inside the university or college, uh, as well as the community directly around it. Um, and then I also want to give you a philosophical answer. Um, the practical answer is literally doing and learning. That is to say, uh, and, you know, you have these contested views and you want to go out and engage with people and create a space where you're trying and testing different ideas and everyone is learning in the work, in the work in the community, which is reading different conceptions of the common good, right? From Aristotle on down to talking about what might work and then to say, okay, how can we actually create productive engagement? And what does productive even look like? And let's go try some of these things. And then making sure you come back and engage in a lesson learning, lesson conversations, even that hopefully is connected to some sense of output and outcomes. Now, you may not do it through just one event, but if you hold yourself accountable and say, we'd like to be able to think about the following indicators, both in terms of personal development and how we're productively engaging in our community to be able to move something. Let's see what's working. Let's test different things. Let's, in seeing those different things happen, then come back and say, both on an intellectual level and then in terms of the actual test, are we seeing what we intended to see, right? You can now see my bias as being a molecular biologist in terms of having this hypothesis, going and testing and so on. So, and I think that everyone in the kinds of communities that you're talking about is able to do this. And if you can bring in the knowledge and 
have the kinds of conversation that say, you know, is, should we be Burkean in terms of being very deliberate or should we be looking to make huge changes and, and really try to upset the apple cart and what seems to work, that those kinds of things can be done actually in a practical sense in the communities in which we work. That's at one level. On a philosophical level, uh, the theory of change to this work really comes down to building a field. And building a field is about creating some major hypotheses and then creating the support behind it uh, to actually push it in terms of funding, in terms of prioritization, in terms of people's mind share, as well as what happens, for example, in schools, but also what happens outside of school and work and so in communities and so on and so forth. And that really happens from the work that I've done by starting at four different, uh, four different parallel tracks. One is trying to develop this co-defined civic learning narrative, an identity that speaks to both the heart and the mind and leads to changing habits. The second is having a very robust research agenda that also develops measurement tools. The third is thinking about hyperscale. Because what you want to do in this space is not go from serving 250 young people to 500. You're going to have to figure out a way to serving 3 million and 10 million. And how do you get from good ideas to that level? And so you have to fundamentally think about this in a different way. And then fourth, how do we actually learn by doing? Start a set of pilot programs in different environments, red, purple, blue, rural, urban. Test this larger conception of civic learning and use those lessons to inform the other parallel tracks. So I wanna pull in one of the, uh, the questions from the participants here, which is, and I just partly because you just signaled at it, but I wondered if you could go a little deeper. What do you see as the role of humanities education uh, in particular? I think obviously we're at a moment where institutions of higher education are facing cuts in many cases, humanities disciplines are often seen as kind of distant from some of the workforce mm -hmm. development outcomes, et cetera. So what's the role of humanities education in this civic learning ecosystem? There's so many answers to this. And let me just make sure that I start out with naming my bias. I went to a liberal arts university. So did my wife. Uh, so my whole family went to liberal arts institutions. I was on the board of a liberal arts institutions. Uh, I am very, very biased here. My father was a professor at Jesuit University. So was my wife. <laughs> so um, not surprisingly, I believe deeply in the idea of uh, liberal arts and humanities being at the core of the development of every young person. Uh, and why do I think this is important? You actually hit upon it just at the end of that question, Andrew. Um, there is a tendency to want to silo the kinds of skills and innate abilities, what one is called social and emotional development, that we want to we want to have in every young person, and think of it in a very either rationalist kind of like this is what you need for work type of perspective, or in terms of output of this is the degree you want to achieve. When in fact, if you actually go and look at the skills you're trying to develop in your workforce, especially your 21st century workforce, what you find is it almost completely overlaps with the same set of civic skills that we've been talking about wanting to develop for millennia. And that it overlaps with the types of dispositions that you want to have in every citizen, little c, of your community in terms of having agency and being able to work together and so on. So I think that there's a tendency to want to rip these things apart and create silos when in fact there's greater power in bringing them together and demonstrating, no, no, the very skills, the very thinking, the very approach of looking at the tensions of issues and trying to figure out, you know, kind of a Hegelian thesis and antithesis to synthesis type of mechanism is actually the way in which people work to problem solve. And that's what you want on the shop floor. It's what you want in, in on your white collar. And it's what you want in your leaders. And so uh, I actually think that you can take a liberal arts education and apply it both to the civic learning aspects of it, to the workforce aspects of it, and I think that at times, trying to create the silo actually hurts the ability to sell this. So I will want to move back toward uh, kind of building the story uh, of kind of how we make the things happen that you're talking about. But I'm wondering if we can take one kind of uh, turn down a spur and just consider uh, how is all this, like when you started this research, uh, 
you, you, because you studied molecular biology, may have known there was something called a coronavirus. But the, the rest of us did not. Uh, and I'm wondering how the current crisis affects either your thinking about the issues that you've been exploring or the, the practical work or, or both. So I think the current situation only makes me want to double down on the work, uh, if not triple down. And you know a little bit about this, Andrew, because I've been leading a short-term project um, that is intending to re-energize localities this summer to come together and work with civic organizations and youth-led entities to identify acute local needs, either because of COVID or because we've got an upcoming election and how young people can step into the breach and take leadership roles to really tackle these issues uh, over the course of this summer. And it's called the Civic Spring Project. For those of you who are interested, um, we will in the next couple of days at the Woodrow Wilson website and hopefully Campus Compact and also have a, a link to it, uh, actually doing a call for proposals uh, from throughout the country. Uh, very much would love to have universities, colleges uh, apply to do this work. But the motivation for that was a recognition that if there is no this, there is no better time, and better is the wrong word, more acute need for all people, especially young people, to step up and engage civically in very deep way, uh, not only intellectually, but literally in their work, to be able to ensure that our society persists and thrives. And so when you think about all of this work and the skills that we're trying to do, in a very real sense, I would hope that everyone uh, who is part of this work thinks about not only what are you teaching and how are you ensuring that you're getting through the semester, but also how can you ensure that the skills that you're developing and everyone who's engaged in the work with you now takes them in the summer into real practical ways of ensuring that our local communities can sustain themselves, can thrive, can be ready for whatever happens this fall, can be prepared for the election, can be prepared for whatever happens next with this virus and all of its implications. We need people to step up and we need to give them mechanisms to do it and make sure they have the skills and dispositions to approach that. So I, just to stay uh, and maybe go deeper on some of the issues we've been exploring, another question that came in that I wanna get to before we, we move further, uh, and, and maybe it leads you into some of the kind of next steps, but the, the question is really about the sort of sharing an interest, the questioner in uh, the idea of a common narrative um, but also recognizing the reality of the deep fragmentation and specialization of higher education. And one example they give is that even in our field, that sort of people use community engagement and civic engagement in ways that are either sometimes a little bit vague and don't really define a lot, or they actually carve out the sort of more political understanding of civic engagement in contrast to community engagement. So you know, what, what is our chance for bringing us together around a common narrative, given our tendency toward fragmentation and the kind of glee that sometimes academics take in having a particular thing that is separate from other things? I think it goes back, so it's a very real question, right? And there are multiple uh, questions embedded in that. One is about language and definition. Another one is related to taxonomy and grouping. Uh, and another is about means to an end. Um, and I would, uh, I would always go back to what are the aims that we intend to achieve in terms of the long-term goal, the actual long-term impact and outcomes we want to see, and then giving great, great uh, uh, space to be able to determine the mechanisms by which we want to try to achieve it and see what works. Um, and recognizing, of course, that it's human beings, and so it's not about trying to create widgets or even some of the experiments that happen under a Petri dish in a lab. Um, some of these things may not be as replicable as other things. And so I raise that simply to say that it's okay for us to have slightly different definitions and slightly different views of how to go about attacking the problem. If we start from a common conception of what it is that we're trying to achieve, and that's the tension where we need to have the conversation, right? You started this whole uh, day off, Andrew, by talking about wanting to make sure that there was full involvement right, in our democracy. And I would say, knowing this, and I have also know who I've mentioned as being my funders, that that is not a contested issue, that um, 
there is common understanding and desire to want to get there. You can then start to have very real debates about how you define uh, uh, what having full involvement and, and engagement really looks like, and then very real debates about how to get there. I think if you start with having a debate about how to get there and what's the best approach, you're never actually going to make it. You need to provide a kind of flexibility to test and letting, if not a thousand flower bloom, at least letting us to test many, many different things and then see what things are worthy of trying again and trying in different places. So a couple more questions that I think also are, are worth uh, staying with here. Um, one, one asks, essentially, in the context of a, a world defined by a whole bunch of inequalities, what role do dissent and social justice movements have in student civic learning? <laughs> okay, so now uh, I want to separate out here for a moment uh, a little bit about my own research and the work that I did that tried to create a collective sense of where people are from my personal view is Raj Vinokoda, right? And this is one of those uh, uh, positions and situations where um, things can get a little dicey between the two, right? In the sense that if we want to think about um, concepts of uh, dissent and uh, social justice, I think they need to be at the core uh, because um, they are motivating factors that actually lead people to want to engage and want to see change. And I'm certainly one of those people. At the same time, it's very important that both of those items don't become ends in and in themselves, right? And I think that this is part of the challenge that we find ourselves, is that there are many, many, especially young people, but it's not just young people, who view things like dissent and these, some of these issues as ends in themselves, rather as means to achieve some other end that are worthy of testing and trying, but may not work. And if they don't work, then are worthy of putting to the side and going and trying something else. If your only tool that you want to use is dissent uh, or slacktivism or yelling and screaming, we're not actually going to make progress. There are times and places for each one of those, but they are merely tools in a larger toolbox. And by the way, that was Raj Vinokoda speaking as opposed to the research, just to be clear. <laughs> Uh, so uh, he, here's a, a question that I, I think is related in some ways, but also goes in a different direction. And it happens to be one, it comes in from uh, somebody out there uh, watching us, but it's a thing I'm totally obsessed with. Um, so I'm excited that it came in, which is, uh, you know, we're obviously focusing uh, and sort of discussions about education sort of drive us to focus on younger people. It's also true that older people, especially among the voting public, vastly outnumber young people and also hold disproportionate power in all kinds of ways that young people don't. And also it's true that young people will have to live with the consequences of decisions made right now for much longer uh, than older people. And so how do, we, how do we affect older people as part of this conversation? Because it's not as if like all of us see problems with the civic uh, the quality of civic life among older people, and then we pivot and say, let's fix it among young people. So what's the role of, of older Americans in this conversation? Am I an older American at this point? I'm just waiting. Just <laughs> For the per current purposes, I think we I are. I think I am. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I... God, our times change. Okay. <laughs> so um, so uh, let me just say that my research uh, had very little to talk about. And, and just to be clear, that's because the frame of the research was really looking at the youth development ecosystem, which I uh, take to include the K-12 system, uh, higher education, and a number of other uh, major structure and mechanisms. Uh, but it did not look at older people. So just that, so you understand that the research doesn't, doesn't speak to this. Um, at the same time, I think that if we are to have any kind of change over any what I would call reasonable uh, period of time, so let's say between now and our 250th anniversary, for example, that investing in young people is necessary but not anywhere near sufficient. And I would suggest that there are at least two or three things that need to happen so that 
we can get there. Once again, Raj Vinakota speaking uh, on, my kind of, on my own platform and my own beliefs. Uh, number one is that uh, we absolutely need to focus on localism and community building as a way of creating a foundation for us to get to what I'll call nation building. Um, I think that that is the place from my research, but also from just talking with folks, that we can start to create this sense of common good in a much more real way, in a much more tangible uh, way, and developing the trust and hope that you want to see. Right? That then leads me to my second uh, perspective on this, which is at its core, we are suffering from a tremendous lack of trust as a country. Um, and localism can help drive some of that. But I think that the other thing we need to figure out how to do, and I don't have the answer for this yet, is, is how to create the types of platforms and spaces where people who come with very different perspectives can at least start to view themselves again as human beings and as Americans, uh, even if they may have fundamentally very different perspectives and views. That also leads to a sense of a new narrative because the narrative has to be around Americans and human beings and that even if we may have fundamentally different views about things that are very near and dear to us, that this movement towards dehumanization of you know, kind of the othering and so on is having real implications for how it is that we view people with whom we don't, uh, don't agree, right? I can't tell you the number of times that I feel a whole sense of emotional reactions to certain points of view that, you know, you have to be able to learn how to be able to dissipate and still engage, right? Those types of practices have to be developed and we have to create and figure out how to create a platform, not just for young people, but for middle-aged people like me and older, wiser people uh, as well, uh, so that you can engage in this work. Once again, I think doing it at a local level where you're engaging, hopefully face-to-face, -face, right? Video doesn't really give you that opportunity, but being able to engage face-to-face -face, uh, can do it. On a personal level, I will tell you, it's one of the reasons that I moved from Washington, D.C. to a much smaller town of 8,000 people here in Maine, so I could engage in that communitarianism where you actually have to come together and decide on the budget. And you're looking at everyone walking down the street after you've made those decisions and you figure out what the priorities are for a, a, a city and a community. So there's a lot there. I wanna raise one other issue too within this context, which, is the con which hasn't been discussed, which is national service. Um, I think at its core, if we want to have a long-term perspective on this, in addition to civic learning and education and so on, is we really need to think about what role national service can play at the center of development of all Americans. Uh, and by the way, by Americans, I mean people who live in this country, uh, whether or not they are citizens of this country. Um, there was a report that just came out around this issue um, uh, that started talking about national service and its more, most general conception. Um, and I think it needs to be instituted, if not in a, in a rigorous sort of way, certainly in a set of approaches so that many, many more people can engage in national service in a deliberate sort of way of helping other people. So that's a long-winded answer. I apologize, but it's a, it's a broad question. Yeah, no, that's great. And I'm just going to make a tiny plug here. Our first session tomorrow is just really a kind of, uh, kind of a show and tell about Campus Compact's work. And one of the things we'll be highlighting is our national service programs. We have uh, close to 800 national service members connected directly to campus compacts across the country, precisely because we do think it's an extraordinary way to build individual capacity in those uh, members, those service corps members, but also in the communities they serve, the work they're doing is that community weaving work in almost, I mean, in all cases. And so um, I think, yeah, that's something people can check out. Andrew, I would mention two other things. One is for those of you who haven't seen it, David Brooks did a piece on national service. I think it's titled National Service Now. <laughs> it just came out um, uh, late last week. People may want to read it. It talks about a bill right now that is trying to wind its way through uh, Congress. And for those who are very uh, major supporters uh, of this, they may want to be aware of that. Um, the second thing I should mention, I don't want to duck this issue. I think 
that there's a need for government reform. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, elections and people feeling like they're actually being able to make an impact on this direction of this country. I'm going to leave it at that because I am not an expert in that space. I know many people who are, who have spent a lot of time thinking about what could be uh, cross-partisan approaches for thinking through this. I raised just one organization of many as being issue one uh, that really is thinking about this, but there are many, many others. If anyone's interested in that space and is looking for connections, feel free to ping me, uh, but it's not my area of expertise, but it needs to be one of the pillars of the work when we think about adults and, and their engagement across this. So if we move back to um, kind of more grounded in your research and, and where you see this work going, uh, what, what, is the, what are the key things that higher education needs to be doing? What are the key things that the people in higher education institutions, whether in faculty roles, staff roles, students, uh, what should people be pushing their institutions to do? And, and what are the things that they can just be doing kind of in their own efforts? Um, so I would say that all of those of you who are involved in higher education uh, have a tremendous opportunity and responsibility. And that is to develop the user's guide for democracy and self-government. Uh, Campus Compact certainly fits the bill in terms of uh, one key aspect of doing that but uh, you can do it in so many other ways. I will give you just a few very practical examples. Um, we were just talking about the need for platforms and spaces where people can engage across different, with very different points of view. Universities, colleges, all higher education institutions uh, have an opportunity to do that, frankly, in a way that you know I took for granted when I went to college, and I wish I had other opportunities, again, uh, for such environments. And so, creating the space for people to challenge each other, to think through deeply, to come uh, with some basis of thinking about their own perspectives, thinking about other people's perspectives, i.e. being educated in a small e sense into the conversation, not only allows you to actually think about uh, the, uh, the content, but also starts to develop the practice, right? The habits of mind, the habits of thought, that are so important that we want everyone to take. And in that way, you're a role model because you need to be able to demonstrate that. You need to be able to demonstrate, right, F. Scott Fitzgerald's capacity to take two competing ideas and still be able to hold them in your mind, think them through, come to some kind of synthesis, or think them through and come to some agreement, a, a view about why one takes precedence over the other without demeaning the person or the persons who are making those arguments. Um, I think that's critical in the way in which you walk and talk and chew gum in all of the spaces that you're in. There's a second aspect of this, and it links both the localism work I was talking about uh, in my prior question, but it also links to what is the role of your institutions in the larger space, especially in this environment. Uh, you have a tremendous responsibility, uh, not only to everyone who attends your institutions, but to the community around you. And I believe that civic learning happens not only in those spaces that are forced spaces, but they also happen in the ways in which you interact and work directly with the high schools, K-12 schools, with other community institutions around you, uh, and how you can take a proactive role in the space. Uh, believe it or not, I'll go, I will assert for this moment that you actually are better resourced than almost any other institution around you, even in this highly resource scarce environment. And so anything that you can do that actually leverages your capabilities in those communities is really, really powerful. And it could be as simple as being able to help ensure the health and security and food security of the people in your communities. And it could be as major as actually engaging in other ways to push forward, make sure you're ready for the election, think about the census, so on and so forth. There's multiple ways of doing that, but you are a community and a powerful institution in every community in which you're working. I, that just, uh, the, the kind of example of the range of activities that this might uh, kind of engage, uh, led me to think about, there's a kind of, I, I'd say a debate among folks engaged in community engagement in higher education that's focused on 
should we be solely focused on engaging our students in what you might call change making work work that is about fundamentally uh, altering the conditions in which people are living in order to make our societies more equal etc or um, is it appropriate, legitimate, et cetera, to engage students in work that is simply about meeting the needs of people in the current moment, even if it's not sort of altering structures in ways that have lasting uh, significance more broadly? And you kind of mentioned both of those activities as part of what colleges and universities might be engaged in. Um, and certainly right now, you know, I think obviously we are seeing around us acute need from the health standpoint, from the, the basic needs in, in an economic sense, et cetera. And I'm wondering, as you've been kind of engaging with these varieties of thinking about civic learning and thinking about it in, in this ecosystemic way, just what your thoughts are about whether there is learning to be acquired for, for young people through both kinds of work, change-making work and you know, need addressing work? And if, if so, what, what might be different about them? So um, three types of answers here. I'm gonna to try to go through them quickly, not because they don't require careful thinking, but rather let me just throw them out and we'll see where we go. One is I would suggest that there's also a third way besides change-making and direct work to talk about, which is um, the strengthening of institutions. Um, that is, uh, I think it's really important that we not only engage in uh, kind of toward with the social justice lens towards getting our, our world to be better, but also to acknowledge that there are institutions that have to be at the core of functioning effectively that some of which are and so therefore need to be protected and some of which that need further strengthening and that are core of what's ensured our existence and, so, and, and thriving at, in different ways at different times over the last 250 years. So I would just throw out that dimension on top of the other two dimensions that I think every student should be thinking about. Um, in terms of this debate of, uh, and challenge around systemic versus direct work, uh, Andrew, you're probably uh, challenged with this too, which is like in the philanthropic world, how are people really, you know, kind of coming at this and saying, okay, if I have a finite amount of resources, where am I going to put it now in a time of very acute basic needs and yet a very clear understanding that this is a moment in time where you may be able to move systems in a way that's usually not the case, right? And unfortunately, these things are orthogonal and you can't measure one versus the other in some simple kind of mathematical calculation. Um, my view on this, right, in the, in the world of finite resources is that um, everyone has a role to play and you have to decide where you wanna play, taking into account and ensuring that all the roles are being played. Now, that may sound awfully um, highfalutin, as some people would say, uh, philosophical, as what others would say, but I also, I wanna be honest about, this. people have certain capacities, assets, capabilities, passions that come at this, and figuring out which one of these are, uh, are important at this moment in time, I think is really, really critical. I would say that the greatest role that um, adults could play for young people is to be able to share in the options available and work with young people to say, okay, where do you want to engage right now? And be able to then create the sense of agency and provide the mechanisms for them to be then able to engage in whatever way uh, that they want to. That may not answer the question for Raj Minakoda or Andrew Sungson going to Foundation X or Y and wanting to get funding, right? I mean, that's, it's just difficult. Um, but I think it's just a recognition that both are in a high need state right now. And I think in the end, passion uh, should drive you to go work in the one that really uh, motivates you right now. And then when it comes to young people, it's our role as adults to make sure that we support them to go down that path and are successful. So I'll leave it at those two. I, you know, drive me in whichever way you want to, or if there's other questions. Well, I think, uh, and it, it, I think it's related in some ways. Um, another question I think would be great to engage with at the moment. Um, you know, I think so. We'll share through the various platforms people are uh, engaging the link to your report. Um, but but the report grounds this work in a conception of ecosystems and in strengthening not just civic learning, but civic learning 
developing ecosystems. And I'm wondering uh, if you might, might talk about the role of partnerships, the role of connections among institutions, organizations. Uh, how, how does that fit into the, the kind of idea of ecosystem building and, and why is it important for organizations to look around and think about potential partnerships? Um, so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this, Andrew, so thank you. Uh, you don't even know this, but I've been spending a lot of time recently thinking about um, what is the value of networks um, and how do networks actually, my argument is basically that networks are going to be the mechanism to drive the kind of social change, the improvements that we want to see, even the institution building that we need to have right now in our democracy in order for it to flourish. And so there is no single institution or player that has the leverage in our current societal framework to actually be able to drive the change uh, because it requires so many different dimensions to be impacted from uh, in terms of the actual work and the standards of practice and the research that's necessary to understand this to the grassroots mobilization to the policy drive that you need to uh, make make this a possibility, local, regional, state, <coughs> federal, um, to the narrative development that needs to happen. That can't happen just because one person uh, goes on their Twitter feed and decides that they've created that mechanism, right? And so networks are, in, in my sense, going to be the only way in which we drive change at scale. And, um, you know, to your change makers, type of perspective, I think it's really, really important that young people and that our institutions model this work. And so what does that mean? I think it means that uh, you need to recognize what are the assets and strengths that you bring to individual networks, to institutional networks, and focus on how those assets and strengths then connect with other people's capacities. Where can you double down because you're both very good at certain things, where can you complement each other to try to move mountains? And that requires a level of humility uh, at, in at least two ways. Number one is recognizing what you're good at and what you're not good at. And number two is recognizing that you're in this for the long game. That this kind of change doesn't happen overnight, that it requires a tremendous amount of resources, starting with intellectual and talent and good people, uh, but also funding and so on and so forth. And so you have to see this in the long game sense, but that's where actually networks can, uh, can accelerate the work and make it more likely to be successful. Um, I uh, was recently uh, just reading a book, uh, Leslie Crutchfield's uh, How Change Happens. Um, and she talks about the power of networks actually be able to drive significant change and you know, take some great examples across the spectrum. Um, and that was where my thinking around networks was developing very recently. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that's great. It's interesting because one of the insights that I associate with her from an earlier book that I can't remember the name of. Uh, Forces for Good? Maybe? Yes. Yeah. Is the idea that, that, you know, the forms of organization that lead to s producing social goods, public goods, are very different than the forms of organization that lead to the creation of private goods. And that, uh, you know, I think in higher education, that's a constant struggle, whether kind of corporate models uh, are appropriate to the university. And I think it's, a, you know, we're gonna see that battled out one, not one more time, but right now in, in right. intense ways, given resource uh, scarcities, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so uh, a, a powerful thinker <laughs> about uh, this space. Um, so, uh, Andrew, if I could jump in, right? I mean, yeah. the, one of the concepts here that, that's come out of, of that whole area of thinking um, is this concept of doing and thinking, right? I think an action tank, I think, is, uh, is the concept, right? I mean, that's what universities should be, right? It's, there should be action tanks. Absolutely. And again, we're, we're seeing some that have really uh, shown tremendous capacity to spring right. into action in that way, which has really been striking because it isn't what we always associate with our institutions. Um, I think this will be, well, we'll see how many we have time for. 
Um, we have a few really hard ones, so I'll see okay. uh, how many we have time for. Uh, to keep going <laughs> oh, right I think we're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the question is, what do you mean, that is you, Raj, by the social changes we want to see? In other words, I think there's a sense that you may be referring to a sense of agreement about what we'd like to see. And, and I wonder, like, yeah, what, what can you say about that? And, and maybe how that relates to the consensus that emerged through the work that you did. Um, I think there's a recognition that um, our social fabric is frayed, uh, is fraying and frayed and uh, don't know how much more it can withstand. Um, and what, by that, what I mean the social changes we want to see is the concepts of trust in neighbors, in others, um, this uh, tremendously worrisome set of uh, uh, of measures about um, kind of uh, how Democrats thinks of Republicans, how Republicans think of Democrats, and um, and yet at the same time a set of measures. Uh, I think that came out from a group called Common Ground that actually talks about the fact that the middle is just fed up and tired <laughs> about all of this. Um, and so when I talk about the social changes that we want to see, I'm not talking about it in a uh, I'm sorry to be euphemistic about this, kind of in a civil rights 1960s sort of change. What I'm talking about is how do we rebuild our communities to build that sense of trust, uh, to build the sense of that we're all actually engaging and working towards a common good in uh, agreeing to disagree at times and uh, appreciating the fact that, um, you know, that policy gets made because you bring many people with many different views together and they're forced to compromise those kinds of concepts are the ones that I'm most worried about when I talk about the social change I want to see. Um, in addition to that, I would go back to a comment I made earlier, which is kind of a recognition that um, part of uh, what we want to see is this tension of both elevating kind of a patriotic history view of our country that does celebrate it for what it has wanted to be and has been in so many different ways and yet also kind of this social justice angle that says, but not yet there, not yet close to there. And so we wanna to continue to go on that path to come as close as possible to what the Declaration of Independence stated. So then this, this will be the last one. Okay, uh, so I'm assuming this will be hard a, then. <laughs> that was a tough one that you handled very well. So we have to see whether right, we can keep up okay. in the ante. Uh, you know, I, I think the question is kind of motivated by our conversation about the recognition of deep inequalities that exist now, including in access to high quality education and high quality civic education. Um, and, you know, in the context of uh, wanting to provide examples of successes that show that, that a pathway is possible, um, I think both to us and also in the context of education for young people, do you, do you have some examples for you about uh, context in where people have successfully come together to combat inequality and and actually move us closer to some of the values. Like what, what would we be pointing to either that says this is possible or that is the sort of thing for students that we would say this is, this is where you can find, where we can dig in and understand what happened. So I would actually have people go look at a couple of different things. One is for those of you who are aware of the work uh, uh, that Weave communities are doing, uh, community building. Um, you can go look up a Weave. I think it's both based, uh, uh, there's some of their work is based at the Aspen Institute, uh, and you can look in their website. There's also a Weave community. And Andrew, after this, I'll send you a link to kind of a larger set of communities that has hundreds of examples of communities coming together to try to work to deal with inequality, and how to uh, support each other, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's that's one way I would say. Um, number two is even if um, the um, actually number two would be uh, to go look at uh, institutions like uh, Better Angels um, and institutions like that who are working now in multiple states and thinking about both the psychology of how to work across difference and so on. So there are institutions now that are expanding fairly quickly that are around this issue. Um, the third I would say is, and I, I wanna be very careful here because I understand that I have a bias as a education reformer um, who was involved uh, uh, you know, kind of with starting the seed schools and then 
uh, running them for 18 years. Um, I would say that there are issues where significant groups of people with very different perspectives came together with good intentions to try to achieve greater equality. Whether we succeeded or not, I think is a different question than whether we actually came together across significant political perspectives and viewpoints and tried to make a difference. Um, I would argue that a significant portion of the education reform movement was just that. I would also argue that the movement that that education reform movement had many, many problems, right? I'll point out two because I was in, involved in them. Number one is thinking way too much about measurement as the mechanism, and especially measurement around ELA and math as driving the focus of whether or not we were successful institutions. I think that was a problem. I think that that pendulum swung too far. The, pen, the thought was good. I think at its core, there were many good ideals there, but it didn't actually take. Um, the second one is, would be uh, is failing to recognize that the path to success doesn't end at the doors of high school. Many, many of us thought that if we gave you a high school diploma and got you into college, our work was done. And it took us a decade of work before we even started to recognize it. And another decade that we're just get, finishing up before you recognize that actually this is a much longer path around which you need to develop a whole set of systems. I say that simply to say, I'm not suggesting that this that it was some kind of perfect world, but rather that there are times where you have many different people come together with the intention of trying to do different things. That's one example. I could probably think of a few more, and I would also urge you to go look at Weave and other institutions there that are trying to do it from the local basis and moving those. Well, uh, you you passed the test, Raj. You handled even the very tough ones at the close. Um, and we are unfortunately out of time. I first want to thank you for uh, engaging with us. I think this was, for me, certainly a really interesting uh, conversation. I hope it was for folks who are engaged with us. And um, we have shared or are sharing the link to your report so people can dig in more deeply. And we'll share other links uh, that you provide that you mentioned as well. Um, I want to thank all the folks who, uh, I wish I could say all your names, but I don't have time, but all the people who sent us questions, that was Thank terrific. You. Those were really, really provocative, interesting uh, questions that, that spurred, I think, uh, great uh, reflections from Raj, so I really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, it's weird that we can't see and, and hear folks, but I, I'm giving you a, a round of applause right here, Raj, and I thank you. Thank you. Uh, and really enjoyed it. Thank clapping you. and cheering wherever they are. <laughs> we are um, about to head into a 15-minute break, so we will reconvene at what will be 5 p.m. Eastern time. You can make the appropriate adjustments for your time zones, uh, and then we will be. Uh, coming back for the Campus Compact Impact Award celebration. So a fun part of our several days together. So again, thanks, Raj. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, and we'll see you again Thank you, in 15 minutes.
aid your pantry and grab your beverage. We're about to start with our next session. Good early evening or afternoon or whatever time zone it might be where you are. I am Andrew Seligson, president of Campus Compact, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Campus Compact Impact Awards celebration. We are extremely excited to celebrate the exemplary efforts of extraordinary people. We we give awards uh, as an element of advancing our mission by calling attention to extraordinary work and allowing others to see how they can also, as individuals and as institutions, lead change in our campuses, in our communities, for the benefit of our democracy and all of us. Uh, so that's our high-minded reason for doing this. It is also just fabulous to celebrate wonderful people doing life-affirming work. And while we'd love to be doing this, in person, we are also just thrilled that we get to do this even from afar, connecting virtually. So you should feel free to whoop and holler in your homes or wherever you're joining from. If you know our recipients, uh, feel free to post positive comments in the chat or the social media feeds. If uh, you don't know them, but you're just excited by what they're doing, you can share that. And you know, I think a lot of us over the last months have learned that our collective human capacity for ingenuity and creativity and finding ways to connect is unlimited and extraordinary. And so uh, join with us, have a little fun, uh, as we also do this serious work of celebrating extraordinary achievements and people who are blazing paths for all the rest of us. Uh, so I'm going to be joined at various points by uh, different colleagues from Campus Compact, and I'm, uh, I'll introduce them along the way. And so we will begin uh, with two of our awards that honor uh, terrific faculty members doing great work. Uh, and we'll start with the Ernest Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement. I do want to mention for both this award and the one that follows, uh, we are really grateful to the Swearer Center at Brown University, who has been a great partner with us uh, in every aspect of making these awards happen. And it is, it's a lot of work from uh, putting together the process to executing it. Uh, and so we really appreciate everything uh, that they put into this. So the Ernest Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement pays tribute to the memory of Ernest Linton, who raised the profile and status of faculty professional service, both nationally and internationally. Linton was a Holocaust refugee from Germany who came to the United States as a young man. He studied physics and became a physics faculty member and administrator both at Rutgers University and at UMass Boston. He participated uh, in creating many things, many institutions that, uh, that persist, uh, including the Coalition for Urban and Metropolitan Universities uh, and its flagship journal, Metropolitan Universities Journal. 
And in all of his work, Linton sought to ensure that the university was relevant to the social and political questions of the moment. He championed a vision of service that embraced collective responsibility and an understanding of colleges and universities as catalysts, not only in the discovery of new knowledge, but also in, in its use in addressing social issues. The award honors early career faculty members who through their teaching, their scholarship, their professional service, and their civic and community engagement advance the public good through innovative reciprocal partnerships. And here to tell you about the recipient uh, and finalist for this year's award is my colleague Clayton Hurd, Campus Compact's Director of Professional Learning. Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever it may be you are. Uh, it's my pleasure to present the next two uh, Campus Compact Impact uh, Faculty Awards. Uh, the recipient of this year's Ernest A. Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty is Chris Christina Santa Maria Graf, Assistant Professor of Urban Teacher Education at IUPUI. Dr. Santa Maria Graf has expertise in bilingual multicultural special education and applies her skill in working with Latinx immigrant families of children with disabilities in community engaged family centered projects. Her scholarship focuses on the ways that community engaged partnerships can transform inequitable practices impacting youth with disabilities at the intersection of race, class, and other markers of difference, identity markers of difference. Uh, her efforts are currently focused on family as faculty approaches in special education programs, which position community stakeholder knowledge and knowledge making as central to the process of transforming systems. This work has contributed to deep reciprocal collaborations, not only in her department and university, but among families, practitioners, administrators, and policymakers statewide. Reflecting on her own work in and with communities, uh, Santa Maria Graf writes, and I quote, Rather than entering with ready-made solutions, the work I do is centered in ways to disrupt power hierarchies that in practice do not serve communities, but instead may harm or oppress. The true purpose of community-engaged work is to remember our shared humanity, to be intentional in our words and actions, to embody humility courageously, and to assure equitable processes and outcomes for everyone involved. We are pleased to honor Christina Santa Maria Graf with the Ernest A. Linton Award for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty. Uh, we also wish to honor and acknowledge the wonderful finalists for this year's Linton Award, which include Anjali Dutt, Assistant Professor of Psychology at the University of Cincinnati, Oscar Gaza, Assistant Professor in Pharmaceutical Care and Health Systems at the University of Minnesota, Colin Reinsmith, Assistant Professor in the School of Library and Information Science at Simmons University, Vanessa Rosa, Assistant Professor of Spanish, Latina, Latino, and Latin American Studies at Mount Holyoke College, and Leah Catherine Sal, Assistant Professor of Teacher Education at Loyola University of Maryland. We applaud all of you for your outstanding work and your commitments to community-engaged scholarship. All right, thank you, Clayton. And the second faculty award that we are presenting uh, this evening is the Thomas Ehrlich Award for Civically Engaged Faculty. Thomas Ehrlich is uh, and has been for a long time an exemplary leader of higher education's efforts to strengthen democracy. In a variety of roles as Dean of the Stanford Law School, Provost at the University of Pennsylvania, and President of the University of Indiana, he contributed to the growth of our movement. He chaired the Campus Compact Board of Directors, uh, Tom has authored important studies on educating students for participation in democracy that I think have been influential for many of us involved in this work. And he remains uh, a great friend of the Compact and still an engaged teacher and researcher at Stanford University. The award named for Tom Ehrlich, the Ehrlich Award for Civically Engaged Faculty, honors senior faculty members who are recognized for their exemplary engaged scholarship, including leadership in advancing student civic learning, conducting community-based research, fostering reciprocal community partnerships, building institutional commitments to service learning and civic engagement, and through other means of enhancing higher education's contributions to the public good. And once again, I will turn it over to Clayton to uh, tell us about the recipient and finalists. Hello again. The recipient of this year's Thomas Ehrlich Civically Engaged Faculty Award is Dia Abdo. 
Associate Professor of English at Guilford College. Dr. Abdo, a first-generation Palestinian who was born and raised in Jordan, has focused her scholarship on Arab and Islamic feminisms with a particular interest in Arab women writers. Dr. Abdo has, Abdo has been a leader in harnessing the power of higher education for the public good. In 2015, she founded the Every Campus a Refuge Initiative, which advocates for housing refugee families on campuses, based on the idea that colleges and universities have all the resources necessary, housing, food, care, and skill building, to take in refugees and support them as they begin their lives in their new homes. In the past four years, Every Campus a Refuge has expanded to institutions in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Ohio, Florida, and North Carolina, and continues to grow. Due to her work, Guilford College alone has hosted 53 refugees from Syria, Iraq, Sudan, Uganda, and the DRC. Dr. Abdo writes, and I quote, particularly in the current political climate, it has been truly gratifying and gives me hope for the future to see every campus of refuge coming to life from a mere idea I had in a moment of deep despair. She continues, quote, every campus a, refu a refuge model is an effective and worthwhile vehicle by which we can make small, local dents in a global crisis. We are pleased to honor Professor Dia Abdo with the Thomas Ehrlich Civically Engaged Faculty Award. We also wish to acknowledge and celebrate this year's highly deserving Ehrlich Award finalists, which include Pablo Bose, Associate Professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont, Robin Bakken, Assistant Provost for Civic and Community Engagement at the University of Miami, Suzanne Cashman, Professor of Community Health at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and Joseph Kropinski, Associate Professor in the Department of Architecture at UMass Amherst. Thank you all for your generous contributions to the field and to our world. And I, uh, I brought a hat that I could tip for the occasion to our uh, extraordinary faculty winners. Uh, so I hope you were joining us all in whooping and hollering along uh, as we celebrate those folks. It's been extraordinary for me to learn about both of their work. I also had the opportunity to interview Dia Abdo for our podcast, the Compact Nation podcast, and I encourage everybody to go back and listen to that episode if you didn't hear it. Uh, the work uh, of Every Campus of Refuge is, is incredible, and um, just learning about all of these extraordinary scholars uh, every year is, is really uplifting. We turn now to a new award. Uh, this new award we are very excited about. It is the Nadine Cruz Award for Community Engagement Professionals. Uh, and while we have honored faculty members for quite a long time, we had not had an award honoring community engagement professionals, the people building and leading programs uh, of all different kinds that are community facing oriented toward the public good on our campuses. So we were extraordinarily pleased when Nadine agreed to be honored uh, through the naming of this award and everything we hoped for was realized in uh, learning about the applicants, the nominees for this first cohort of recipients. As I mentioned, this award is named in honor of Nadine Cruz, an innovative leader of community-based -based, community experiential learning and a pioneer of the movement for the public purposes of higher education. Nadine Cruz served as director of the Haas Center for Public Service at Stanford University and as executive director of the Higher Education Consortium for Urban Affairs, or HECUA. She is an accomplished teacher, scholar, and program builder and Nadine is one of those people in this field, and I think many of you will be familiar with many of them, who uh, fake their own retirement. She remains profoundly influential as a mentor, as a lecturer, uh, as a voice in the ear of many, many people uh, whose work reflects her deep ethical commitment, her profound understanding of the realities of community engagement and all of the ethical complexities embodied therein. So this award celebrates her ethical leadership, her advocacy, uh, and her extraordinary contributions to organizations, to institutions, to individuals, and to our field more broadly. Uh, the 2020 recipients have in common that they have demonstrated collaboration with communities focused on transformative change, 
a commitment to justice-oriented work, and an impact on the larger movement to build ethical and effective community engagement locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally, and to introduce us to the recipients of the Nadine Cruz Award is my colleague, our Vice President for Network Leadership at Campus Compact, Marisol Morales. Thank you, Andrew, and hello, everyone. So excited to be um, presenting the awards to the following recipients, um, and so honored that we were able to move forward on this. Um, our, I will be introducing uh, our world recipients, uh, Deborah Gives, Chris Nave, and Cynthia Orellana. Deborah Gibbs is the Faculty Director of Experiential Learning at Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan. She's recognized for her outstanding vision and passion as a community college engagement leader. In her work, she has focused on making equity-focused service learning a key part of the educational experience for students and faculty. She has fostered reciprocal partnerships with local community organizations that led to projects engaging marginalized students, such as developmentally challenged students, economically challenged students, minority students and immigrant or international students. Within the institution, her work has been instrumental in facilitating interdisciplinary collaboration that crosses social and cultural differences. This has led to greater diversity and participation among faculty, staff, students, uh, and students, creating broader impact for the students and the wider community. Next is Chris Nave, who's the Associate, President, uh, Associate Vice President for Community Engagement and anchor institutions at the University of San Diego, and is recognized for his long-term commitment to advancing higher education's community engagement locally, nationally, and internationally. As a leader of the University of San Diego's anchor mission institution, Chris has helped position the university as a bi-national anchor institution. He has worked diligently to educate campus leaders to align procurement, hiring, and admission practices and other economic impact initiatives in ways that benefit local communities. More broadly, Chris has become widely recognized in the field of community engagement for his ability to forge new and long-term community partnerships in the, area, in the areas of housing, poverty, economic development, education, social justice, microfinance, uh, and diversity and inclusion. Our final recipient is Cynthia Orellano. Uh, Cynthia Orellana is the Director of the Office of Community Partnerships at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And she is recognized for her excellence as an emerging community engagement professional who has championed community voices by creating community advisory groups and professional learning opportunities for community practitioners. She has worked on large-scale initiatives with the Mayor's Office and Boston Public Schools to support each institution's strategic process and goals. Cynthia's recent work includes efforts to transform the annual faculty review process at UMass Boston by supporting grassroots strategy to change how community engaged teaching, research, and service are acknowledged at the university. We applaud all of the recipients of the Nadine Cruz Community Engagement Award for their outstanding work and their commitment to justice-oriented community engagement, and we thank them for their dedication and advocacy to enhancing students' civic uh, and community learning ethical partnerships with the community and transformative change. Join me in congratulating our Nadine Cruz recipients. All right, and this time around, I, uh, I raised a glass rather than tipping my cap, but we're keeping the celebration going. Uh, I am excited now to move on to two awards. Uh, I also want to mention the, the vagaries of uh, being in our different places. Some kind of weather event is happening around us in Boston that I'm being a little distracted by. So I will, uh, unless the windows blow in, I will stay with you here. Uh, I'm excited to turn to two awards, again, new awards uh, that we launched this past year, recognizing institutions for institutional transformation. Uh, the Richard Grassi and Eduardo J. Padron Awards recognize respectively four-year and community colleges that have successfully implemented institution-wide efforts to address issues of public concern by aligning teaching, research, practice, and values in service of the common good. We will uh, discuss the 2020 recipients in a moment, uh, all of which have undertaken comprehensive efforts to advance the values 
articulated in the Campus Compact 30th Anniversary Action Statement of Presidents and Chancellors. And in fact, several of the institutions are led by people who were actively involved in the process of shaping those commitments. So I'll start with the uh, Richard Grassi Awards. The, this award is named for Richard Grassi, President Emeritus of Wagner College. During his five years as provost and 17 years as president of Wagner, Richard Grassi transformed his institution into an educator of active participants in democracy and a partner in transforming the diverse working class neighborhood of Port, Port Richmond on Staten Island, where Wagner College is located. Richard focused not only on the transformation of his own institution, but also of higher education more broadly. He served as president of the Coalition of Urban and Metropolitan Universities. He chaired the board of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And most fortunately, from my personal perspective, he served for four years as the chair of the board of Campus Compact, during which time I had the opportunity to work very closely with Richard and saw his deep humanity, his real commitment to students and to the people doing work uh, of all kinds on his campus and throughout higher education, and his belief in the possibilities inherent in every human being and the obligation of higher education to, to find and help bring those possibilities to flourishing. So we are thrilled to have the opportunity to honor Richard through uh, this award. I'm about to uh, identify the winners of the Grassi Award and just say a little bit about them. I wanna mention that uh, each of the winners of both the Grassi Award and the Padron Award also submitted videos, and we will be showing those short videos documenting their community and civic engagement work uh, during the breaks between sessions throughout the conference. So the fir first recipient of uh, the Grassi Award is Augsburg College, where Paul Pribino serves as president. And uh, Augsburg is, <laughs> okay, so uh, we may have these slides in a different order. So we'll work our way uh, to, uh, to aligning what we're saying with what you're seeing. So we apologize for that. Augsburg University is recognized for its commitment to serving as an anchor institution in the Twin Cities, mobilizing institutional resources to benefit local neighborhoods and helping to drive inclusive economic growth in the region. Through mutual grassroots partnerships, including with the neighboring Cedar Riverside community, Augsburg University has built trust as an active member of that community. Through their new strategic plan, Augsburg 150, Augsburg University has further committed to economic sustainability, interfaith leadership, and equity and racial justice. Our next recipient is Bard College. There we go. Uh, Bard College is recognized, and, and I should mention, Leon Botstein serves as president at Bard. Bard College is recognized for its commitment to extending opportunities for liberal arts education to communities historically excluded from opportunity. A cornerstone of this work is the Bard Early Colleges High School Program, which provides access to credit-bearing, tuition-free college courses in the liberal arts for high schoolers from Manhattan, Queens, Newark, Cleveland, and Baltimore. Students who participate in the program are taught by college faculty in undergraduate seminars and receive college credits up to an Associate's of Arts degree. Other programs offered by Bard College, such as the Bard Prison Initiative, further demonstrate their commitment to access to education for marginalized groups. Our third recipient is Metropolitan State University of Denver, where Janine Davidson serves as president. Metro State is recognized for its comprehensive institution-wide approach to planning for institutional change, which has included a civic action plan, emerging assessment, connected efforts across departments, and clarity around institutional goals. As an urban land-grant institution, MSU Denver has committed to being an institution of the city, an integral, visible part of the communities within which it exists. MSU Denver demonstrates a clear and active commitment to strengthening its understanding of urban issues and to partnering with and serving its neighbor organizations in order to better meet the needs of the metropolitan area. And the final uh, institution recognized through the Grassi Award is Seattle University, located in the city where we all would have gathered under other circumstances. Uh, Stephen V. Sunborg serves as president. Seattle University is recognized for its deep place-based commitment to the neighborhoods adjacent to the campus. A highlight of this work is the Seattle University Youth Initiative, 
a partnership with community-based organizations, local government, and K-12 schools to create a cradle-to-career pathway of support for a thousand children and their families in a two-square-mile neighborhood next to the campus. The program has built trust between Seattle University faculty, staff, and students, and community partners, has helped increase academic achievement among local elementary school students, and contributed to the overall health of the community while providing excellent learning experiences for Seattle University students. So join me in recognizing all of the Gracia Award winners. And we now turn to the recipients of the Eduardo J. Padron Award for Institutional Transformation. Again, this for community colleges. This award recognizes uh, Eduardo Padron, or it, it is named in his honor, uh, who is President Emeritus of Miami-Dade College. Eduardo Padron immigrated from Cuba as a boy and entered school in Miami with no English language skills. After graduating high school, he enrolled at Miami-Dade College and went on to earn a doctoral degree in economics from the University of Florida. He returned to Miami-Dade as a faculty member and eventually made his way to the presidency, a position in which he served for 24 years. During that time, he transformed Miami-Dade College into one of the largest institutions of higher education in the United States, recognized as an engine of opportunity and participation for the diverse communities of Miami. He also built a deep commitment to civic engagement and democratic participation into the fabric of the college. And for all of you familiar with Miami-Dade, you know that that, that persists uh, as we speak. Eduardo Padron served on Campus Compact's board of directors, and in 2016, President Obama presented Eduardo Padron with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And I have to say, given that history, it was uh, very significant to us that Dr. Padron uh, responded with great joy to the idea of being honored through this award. We, we may not measure quite up to President Obama and the Medal of Freedom, but we were glad uh, that he was pleased to be honored in this way. So we have two institutions to honor with the first uh, Eduardo Padron Awards. Uh, the first is Raritan Valley Community College in New Jersey, where Michael McDonough serves as president. Raritan Valley Community College is recognized for its longstanding commitment to providing every Raritan student with civic and community-based learning experience, learning experiences. Service learning opportunities are deeply embedded in student life and in the curriculum with service learning courses offered in every academic department. Not only has this enhanced learning and provided professional development opportunities for students, but it has also been integral to addressing the major challenges facing communities in the region. And our second recipient, again from the city where we would have gathered, is Seattle Central College, where Sheila Edwards Lang serves as president. Seattle Central College is recognized for its high level of commitment to social and economic inclusion. This is evidenced by the establishment of an Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, by the ongoing work toward a diversity action plan, and by their commitment to access to education, providing flexible pathways for students from all situations and backgrounds to be prepared for careers and for lives as active and engaged citizens. The result of this work has been the establishment of a wide variety of programs in partnership with local schools and community-based organizations including the Seattle Promise Program and the Academy for Rising Educators. These programs have already demonstrated a measurable impact on Seattle Central Colleges and the local community. Please join me in recognizing these recipients of the Eduardo Padron Award for Institutional Transformation. Those are the recipients of this year's awards. Uh, we are excited to let you know that the next round, it, it all begins again. We open applications for the uh, next year's worth of uh, impact awards on May 15. So you should head to our website, compact.org, to learn more about that. And it's really, again, an opportunity to invite you to think about your own work, those of your colleagues, uh, people who have taught you, people alongside whom you have worked, institutions you know of that are leading the charge to build stronger, more connected institutions in service of the public good. So think about who those people are. Uh, imagine getting a nomination together 
and I hope that we will be learning about uh, folks that whose work it is uh, is exemplary and the kind of work that can inspire and motivate all of us. So uh, that concludes our awards uh, ceremony and our celebration. I want to mention that we will be back tomorrow, uh, starting up a full day of conference activities at 11:30 a.m. Eastern Time, 8:30 on the Pacific Coast. Uh, we have some great sessions tomorrow, um, and I'm really excited to uh, to bring a whole day's worth of work, celebrating not only work that is going on through Campus Compact, but also through many of our member institutions over the next couple of days. So again, we'll be back with you tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time on the same streaming platforms. Thank you for being with us. Congratulations to all the individuals and the institutions honored today. And again, you'll learn more about the work of those institutions through videos throughout the conference. So have a good evening and see you tomorrow. Thank you.